morning, everyone. I'm Ross Dexter. I'm an engineer on the games technology team at Apple, and I'd like to welcome you to Going Beyond 2D with SpriteKit. So before we dive in, I'd like to quickly talk about what SpriteKit is and where it fits in the Apple rendering picture. SpriteKit is Apple's 2D graphics framework for games, and it's designed to be flexible, fast, and easy to use. It's supported across all of our platforms and has an Xcode integrated live editor to make laying out and previewing your game content quick and easy. SpriteKit sits along SceneKit, or other games-oriented graphics framework, and both sit on top of Metal. Traditionally, they've all been used separately in different contexts. SpriteKit for quick and easy 2D, SceneKit as a ready-to-use 3D engine, and Metal to give you direct access to your device's rendering hardware. Instead of keeping all three separate, we think it's time that SpriteKit breaks out of its 2D mold. SpriteKit has a great deal to offer to make using it in combination with SceneKit and Metal attractive. Since they both use Metal under the hood, it should be trivial to render SpriteKit content in SceneKit or to be able to pipe it back into Metal to use however you wish. Lots of 3D games and apps feature 2D content, and SpriteKit provides the perfect means for creating and rendering that content. On top of that, this year in, Apple is introducing ARKit, which takes all the hard work out of creating augmented reality apps. The addition of this new framework provides one more reason why it's time for SpriteKit to go beyond 2D and enter the third dimension. And today we're going to show you how to do it and what you can achieve. In this session, we're going to cover how to render SpriteKit content in ARKit, bringing sprites to the world of augmented reality. Next, we'll show you how to get your SpriteKit scenes into SceneKit and how that can improve your augmented reality apps. And then finally, we'll introduce you to SK Renderer, which allows you to take more control over how SpriteKit updates and renders. All right, let's dive right in with how you can use SpriteKit and ARKit together. But first, we should talk about what augmented reality actually is. Augmented reality combines a real-world view with computer-rendered content. That content gets attached to locations in the real world, so that as you move your device and the view shifts, the content appears to remain in place. That allows you to inspect the content from different angles, as if it were a physical object in front of your device. And this requires a lot of complex tracking and is a real challenge to implement. Thankfully, ARKit does all the hard work for you. When you use ARKit, it leverages your device's camera, accelerometer, and other hardware to track its position and orientation in the real world. All you have to do is provide it the content you want to appear in AR, and ARKit automatically updates the relative positioning of your content as your device moves. If you'd like a deeper dive into exactly how all of this works, I highly recommend checking out the Introducing ARKit session that happened earlier this week. ARKit is able to track and update the position of your content through the use of anchors. That would make AR work. Anchors are 3D points that correspond to real-world features that ARKit detects through scene understanding, which uses your device's camera to perceive and process the world around you. Anchors are easy to create. You can request ARKit to detect one at any time through the API, or you can create one manually using your device's position and orientation. So how do we get ARKit working with SpriteKit content? ARKit is designed to interact directly with SpriteKit. ARKit will ask, your, ask you for SpriteKit nodes to attach to anchors, and then will automatically position, rotate, and scale those nodes as the device moves. It does this so your SpriteKit content will stay aligned with the anchors, giving the appearance that your content is rooted in the real world. Sprites are rendered so they are always facing the camera, so no matter what angle you view them from, they're always facing the camera. This is a technique known as billboarding, and it's commonly used in early 3D games. So you may not be familiar with how billboarding works, so let's go over a few quick examples of how you can use it, let's use 2D content in 3D space. So say we have a sprite positioned in uh, 3D space and a camera observing it. As the camera moves closer to the sprite, the sprite goes larger, as you'd expect, taking it more of the view. As the camera moves further away, the sprite shrinks. Now we'll rotate the camera. As the camera changes its point of view, the sprite continues to face the camera at all times. And this would be the case from any angle we view it from. Let's add another th sprite to our 3D scene here to show how this works with multiple 2D objects. Sprites that are further away are rendered behind sprites that are closer to the camera. 
As the camera moves, the more distant sprite comes into view. Both sprites always face the camera. And this simple technique allows your 2D sprite key content to work in a 3D space. So now that we've shown you how ARKit and SpriteKit work together at a conceptual level, let's take a talk about the actual objects you'll need to implement your app. To work with ARKit and SpriteKit, there are four important objects for you to know about. AR Session, AR Anchor, AR SK View, and AR SK View Delegate. AR Session is the heart of ARKit. It handles all the device tracking and or orchestrates the interactions between ARKit and SpriteKit. It has methods for adding and removing anchors so that, it, you, that you create in your app. To start it up, you just call the run method, and AR Session will begin tracking your device. You just need to provide it an AR Session configuration, which tells ARKit which AR techniques it should use. So when working with SpriteKit, you should just use the AR World Tracking Session configuration, which enables all of the functionality you'll need from ARKit. ARKit defines real-world features through AR Anchor. It represents a position in the real world and contains transform data as well as a unique identifier. ARKit maps AR anchors to the SK nodes that we provide it to render our content. ARKit interacts with SpriteKit through AR SK View, which is derived from SK View. It creates and contains the AR session, so you don't need to create it manually, and has methods for getting related anchors and nodes, so you need to manually track which node corresponds to what anchor and vice versa. It also has a hit test method, which uh, is your primary way of creating anchors. It takes a point on your device's screen and shoots a ray through it, so looking for the nearest point in the real world for you to, 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 for you to attach stuff to. Finally, there's AR SK View Delegate, a protocol derived from SK View Delegate, which lets you react to anchors being added, updated, and removed from the session. All of its methods are optional, and they're the key to using SpriteKit and ARKit together but we'll come back to that in a bit. Let's get started on creating our first ARKit app with SpriteKit. First, we'll create a new iOS project in Xcode. You'll see that in Xcode 9, there's a new augmented reality app template for you to choose. Once you choose the app template, to get started with SpriteKit, select it as your content technology. And that's all there is to it. You're now ready to enter augmented reality. The resulting project looks pretty standard for an iOS app, but let's go through the files that are important to using SpriteKit and ARKit together. First, there's scene.sks. This is a standard SpriteKit scene, and it's where you create and lay out any non-AR content that you want to appear in your app. It will act like an overlay for the AR content, and so it's useful for things like HUD elements, help text, stuff like that. Nodes that have a Z position greater than or equal to zero will draw over any AR content that ARKit adds to the scene. All nodes are managed by, that are managed by ARKit have Z positions that are less than zero. Next, scene.swift. This is the SpriteKit scene's corresponding source file. As with normal SpriteKit apps, this is where you put code to manage your scene, handle gameplay and logic, and is a good place to leverage GameplayKit's various features. And finally, we have viewcontroller.swift. The viewcontroller conforms to AR SK view delegate and its scene view property is an instance of AR SK view, which contains the AR session. The view controller class is your primary means of interacting with AR kit. In the template, it's automatically set up to call run on AR session with an AR world tracking session configuration, so you don't need to add it yourself. This is also where you implement the AR SK view delegate methods that are relevant to you. Now let's talk about the AR kit events that the view controller would need to react to. The first event is when a new anchor gets added to the SK session. When this happens, ARKit will ask the view controller for the SpriteKit nodes you want to associate with an anchor. So this is when we create our AR content. The second event is when an existing anchor is updated by the session. When this occurs, ARKit informs the view controller so you can react to the update. And the third and final event is when an anchor is removed from the session. ARKit tells the view controller so you can perform any necessary cleanup in your app. AR SK view delegate provides methods tied to each of these events. As we mentioned, each of, the, each of these methods is optional, so you only need to implement the ones that matter to you. Let's go over each one. First is the node for anchor method. 
This gets called when a new anchor is added to the session. And ARKit maps that node return from this method, method to the anchor that's passed in. You should implement this if you want to create a custom node for an anchor. If you don't implement the method, a default empty SK node is created for you automatically. The node that gets returned from this method will be moved, rotated, and scaled by ARKit to match its anchor. So if you try and make any changes to the transform, they'll likely be overwritten by ARKit when the device moves. It's useful to know that any children that are assigned to this node won't have their transforms modified. But we'll talk more about this with our next method. Also note that ARKit automatically adds this node to the scene graph, so you don't have to. Next, we have did add node for anchor. This is called after an SK node is mapped to an anchor, so after the previous node for anchor method is executed. If you implemented the node for anchor method, the node that gets passed in here will be the one you returned from there. If you didn't implement, implement it, it will be a default empty node. As we mentioned in the previous slide, the node that's mapped to the anchor has its transform modified by ARKit to follow the anchor as the device moves. As such, if you want to modify the transforms of your content, you should add them as children in here, as ARKit won't modify them. Next, will update node for anchor and did update node for anchor. These methods are called before and after the node is updated with a given anchor's data. True to their names, will update node for anchor is called before the update, and did update node for anchor is called after the update. This occurs when the device moves and the view changes. The node's position, rotation, and or scale is subject to change between calls to these methods. Finally, did remove node for anchor. This gets called when the node is removed from the scene graph, which occurs when its corresponding anchor is removed from AR session. All right, that covers the important parts of the API. Let's take a look at some code. So let's cover creating an anchor. Here we're looking at a handler for the touches began event. When the device reports a touch, we get the location of the touch in our AR SK view. We then provide the touch location to to the AR SK views hit test method, which shoots a ray out into the real world, looking for feature points that we can turn into anchors. It returns an array of all the hits that it registers, sorted from nearest to furthest. We take the nearest hit, and we use this world transform to create an AR anchor, which we then add to the session. And that's all there is to it. Creating anchors could not be simpler. So now that we've added a new, new anchor to the session, the session will ask the view controller for the sprite kit content that we want to attach to it. To do this, we've implemented AR SK view delegates did add node for anchor method. We haven't implemented node for anchor, so default empty node was created for us. And that's what's being passed into this method. So now all we need to do is create the content we want to attach to the anchor and then add it as a child of the node that's passed into the method. ARKit will automatically update the node so that it will follow the anchor as the device moves so you don't need to do anything else. So now that we've shown you exactly how to use AR the ARKit API with SpriteKit, let's enter augmented reality. Let's open our app here. So we see we're doing our video pass through now. We can see our lovely audience out there. You're all famous now. So let's start placing some content in augmented reality. As I tap on my screen, I'm placing content half a meter out in front of me. Here I'm just placing uh, SK label nodes with emoji. Fun fact, you can use emoji in your SpriteKit apps by just using labels. Just paste them in there. And you see they have them in floating in 3D space. And as I move the camera around, they move relative to one another. But just placing them in space is a little boring. I can also place them on a surface. And it will detect an intersection with the surface with the hit test method that we were talking about before. And then it places the uh, emoji on the surface of the table that is detected. But placing emoji is just a little boring. So now we're going to switch into blasting mode. And now we can blow up our emoji. 
which is a little bit more fun. Also, pay attention to uh, the text in, our, in the lower left-hand corner here and the way that our emoji are flipping around when we destroy them, because that's going to become relevant in a moment. So you see how easy it is to quickly uh, create an app and uh, use SpriteKit content to uh, enter augmented reality. This is just a slightly tweaked version of the template app that you can create right now using Xcode 9. And that's SpriteKit with ARKit. So you see how easy it is to enter augmented reality when using ARKit and SpriteKit together. As I mentioned, there are a few other SpriteKit features in there, some of which that were present in the demo, that I'd like to quickly cover. So hopefully you notice the text on the bottom of our screen in the demo app animating. This was done with a single SK label node, thanks to the fact that they now support attributed strings. Attributed strings allow you to specify the attributes of each character in a string, letting you mix things like different colors and fonts in the same label. It uses NS attributed string, and all you have to do is set it on SK label nodes, new attributed text property. The emoji in our augmented reality app spun about in ways that weren't possible until now, thanks to the new SK transform node. SK node already had Z rotation. But SK transform node adds the ability for you to rotate around the X and Y axes as well, allowing for full 3D rotations of sprite gig content. And these rotations apply to all child nodes as well. SK transform node uses orthographic projection, so it doesn't apply any perspective skewing to your nodes. You can specify your rotations through the X, Y, and Z rotation properties, or you can use the specialized getters and setters for Euler angles, rotation matrices, and quaternions. Finally, on the editor side of things, SpriteKit is fully compatible with Xcode's view debugger. It displays the entire scene graph and gives you the neat exploded 3D view of your scene, which can be of great help when you're trying to debug uh, layout co content layout issues. It also allows you to inspect all of your node properties so you can see the state of everything in your scene at the moment the app was paused. This is a really great new feature, so please check out the debugging with Xcode 9 session for more information on it. We've shown you how quick and easy it is to get started with uh, using ARKit and SpriteKit to create an augmented reality app. ARKit handles all of the hard parts of augmented reality for you, and SpriteKit makes rendering content a snap. We've also introduced new features to SpriteKit that give you greater flexibility in developing your apps and give you new options for debugging SpriteKit content. But you may have a few lingering questions. What if we don't want billboarded sprites? What if we want our sprite kit content to be affected by perspective? What if we want to mix 2D and 3D context, content in augmented reality? What if we want to take sprite kit further into 3D? The answer lies in combining scene kit, sprite kit, and AR kit all at once. Scene kit is sprite kit's 3D counterpart. It's a ready to use 3D engine with its own Xcode integrated live editor. What you may not know is that you can use SpriteKit scene, sprite scenes as the material on geometry in SceneKit. That allows you to render SpriteKit content with complex 3D transforms and perspective effects. Additionally, you can easily mix 2D SpriteKit content with 3D SceneKit content in the same context. Like SpriteKit, SceneKit is also integrated with ARKit. Creating a project that uses SceneKit in an augmented, reali augmented reality app is the same as with SpriteKit. Just change the content technology to SceneKit. The API is designed to be very similar to the one you use with SpriteKit, only the names of a few objects are different. Air SK View becomes Air SCN View, and Air SK View Delegate becomes Air SCN View Delegate. As with SpriteKit, the template creates Air SCN View for you, and the View Controller class conforms to Air SCN View Delegate. Now, in the interest of brevity, and because the API is so similar, we won't bother covering the rest here. So next, we want to get our SpriteKit content rendering within a SceneKit scene. Normally with SpriteKit, you have your scene, and you set it on an SK view. SK view then works with UIKit, or AppKit on macOS, to get your content on screen. To get your content rendering in SceneKit, things are handled a little differently. Instead of setting your scene on the view, you set it on the material property of the geometry on which you want the SpriteKit content to appear. 
And then that material works with SceneKit to render your SpriteKit content and then texture map it onto the geometry the material is associated with. So let's go over a few examples of rendering SpriteKit content on SceneKit geometry. Here we have a basic SpriteKit scene. And here's what we get when we render that on a scene on a plane in SceneKit. We can also apply the SpriteKit scenes to a cube or even a sphere. You can use it just like a regular texture, and the sprite kit, as the SpriteKit scene updates, your texture will be updated along with it. So now I'd like to quickly show you how easy it is to use SpriteKit with SceneKit. First, get the SpriteKit scene that you want to use in SceneKit. Next, create the geometry you want the SpriteKit scene to be rendered on. Here, we're creating a simple plane. Then you just need to set the sprite kit scene as the contents of the diffuse property of the plane's material. That will cause the scene kit to render the sprite kit scene to a texture and then apply it to the geometry. Here we're setting the material to be double sided. This causes the sprite kit scene to appear on both sides of the plane. Then we just need to create a scene kit node for the plane and add it to the, the scene kit scene. Now the plane will show up in the scene with the contents of your sprite kit scene texture mapped onto it. So now I'd like to show you a demo of some of the things you can do when you use sprite kit and scene kit together with AR kit. All right. So here I have a, a demo that I've built on top of the sample code that AirKit has released that you can find through their session website. And here it just is detecting a plane for us. Now if I tap on the screen, it places a sprite kit scene for us in the world here. And you see that this is a, a fully live sprite kit scene. You see the trees are animating. And in fact, I can actually interact with this directly. Here, let's actually blow it up a little bit. Since we are in 3D, we can do all kinds of cool things. We can move this guy around, we can rotate, and we can scale. Make it a little bigger. So now I can actually interact with this scene directly. I have controls on my device here. I can move my character around, I can jump around. Ooh. Hard to get over that thing. Yeah, so we can jump around in uh, real time, interact with this just like a normal sprite kit scene rendered in 3D. But just having it sit here on the surface is, is a little boring. We should do something a little more interesting, a little more 3D. So if I actually touch this button up here, the scene flips up, and <laughs> if I touch it again, it separates out the different layers that I have in here. So we don't actually have just one sprite kit scene. We actually have three sprite kit scenes here, one for each layer here, one for the middle, uh, the front, middle, and the background. So this shows you the kind of stuff that you can do when you use sprite kit and scene kit together with AR kit. But maybe you start to feel a little constrained by uh, the, the level here. And maybe we want to have our little, uh, our little guy go out on an adventure on his own. He's going to run out into the real world here. Oh, this button looks kind of tempting. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so that gives you an, an idea of what you can do when you use Sprite Kit in a 3D context with Scene Kit together with AR Kit. So as you saw, using SpriteKit with SceneKit allows for full 3D transforms and perspective, which allows you to do some pretty neat things. It allows you to mix 2D and 3D content within the same context, and it's fully compatible with ARKit. And it works great in general 3D apps as well. So now that we've covered how to work with ARKit and SceneKit, I'd like to introduce you to another new SpriteKit feature, SK Renderer. Let's talk a bit about how SpriteKit works under the hood. As we mentioned in the previous section, with normal sprite kit rendering, you have your scene and you set it on an SK view, which then works with UI kit or app kit to get your content on the screen. SK view handles all the updating and rendering for you. 
The upside of this is that it makes it very easy to get started with SpriteKit. But what if you want to render SpriteKit content in a 3D context? One solution, as we showed you, is to use SpriteKit with SceneKit. Instead of setting your scene on the view, you use it as a material in SceneKit. And this lets you do all kinds of cool stuff. But when SpriteKit updates and renders is still out of your hands, what if you want more control? Maybe we want to update with exact fixed time steps, or update without rendering, or render without updating, or update once and render twice, each time from a different viewpoint. What if we want to work directly with Metal? Enter SK Renderer. You use it instead of SK View to gain more control over SpriteKit. Like SK View, to use it, you just set it, your scene on the ren you, just, you just set your scene on it on the renderer. Unlike SK View, however, SK Renderer lets you determine when SpriteKit performs updating and rendering. It allows you to work directly with Metal, enabling you to do things like render SpriteKit into an off-screen texture to use however you want. This, by the way, is how SceneKit is able to eff efficiently render SpriteKit content in 3D. It uses SK Renderer under the hood. There are four stages to using SK Renderer. Initialization, setting the scene, updating, and rendering. Initialization occurs once. You set your scene at the start, and again, when you want to transition to a new scene. And update and render uh, repeat every frame in your app. Let's look at some code for each, each of these stages. Stage one, initialization. To initialize SK Renderer, all you need to do is provide it with a metal device. Stage two, setting the scene. This works exactly the same as with SK View. Just set your scene on SK Renderer's scene property. Stage three, updating. Also very simple. All you need to do is pass in the current time. Stage four, rendering. This is done by calling the render method, of which there are two flavors. Which one you want to use is situational, depending on how you want to use your SpriteKit content with Metal. Both methods ask you to specify the viewport you like to render into, which is just a CG rec that defines the area SpriteKit will draw into in the render target. And they both take a metal render pass descriptor, which describes that render target that you want the SpriteKit content to draw into. Now, the first method allows you to specify the command buffer to which SpriteKit will schedule rendering commands. A good case in which to call this method is if you're not directly mixing SpriteKit content with other metal content in the same render target. If you want to render a SpriteKit scene into a texture and then apply it to some 3D geometry, like we did in the second demo we showed you, this is the method you'd want to call. The second method gives you more granularity by allowing you to direct which render command encoder SpriteKit will encode its render commands. This is good if you want to directly mix SpriteKit and Metal content in the same render target. Say you want to render some 2D Metal content along with your SpriteKit content, or maybe you want to overlay SpriteKit on top of a Metal scene to display HUD elements. By using the same render command encoder, you can do this much more efficiently than if you were using the first method. All right, that's enough of an API crawl. Let's jump into a quick demo showing SpriteKit rendering in 3D with Metal. So here we have a 3D scene in metal. See, we've got some nice lighting and some shadows going on here. And we have this very tempting looking arcade cabinet with our beautiful SpriteKit framework logo on it. We walk up to it, insert coin. That sounds kind of tempting. I've got a quarter here. Let's plop that baby in. Ah, you see, we've got a full SpriteKit scene rendering on this 3D uh, metal scene. And see, we're using SK Renderer to uh, render SpriteKit into a texture, which we're then mapping onto the front of our arcade cabinet here. And then we're just applying a cool uh, CRT uh, shader to it in Metal to give it this old school look. I can actually move around from any angle I want to here, and I can interact it with like, like this. A little bit of a skew, but you know, maybe this gives you some memories of playing on an arcade cabinet with your friends. You're all crowded up against it. Yeah, you can view this from any angle. You can view this from off from the distance. 
and it shows you some, uh, some of the things that you can do with SpriteKit when you use it with metal. It lets you use it in 3D, and then you can do whatever you want with that texture. So that's SpriteKit and metal working together. SK Renderer gives you more control over SpriteKit than ever before. It allows you to determine exactly when it updates and renders, and by interacting directly with Metal, you can use rendered SpriteGate content any way you see fit. As you've seen today, SpriteGate is useful in both 2D and 3D. It's built to work well with other graphics frameworks like SceneKit and Metal, and it's closely integrated with ARKit, so that creating augmented reality apps is as easy as possible. We've introduced new features that give you more control than ever, allowing you to view SpriteKit content in the view debugger, and also giving you the ability to take direct control over when and how SpriteKit updates and renders with a new SK renderer. Today, we've shown SpriteKit in an entirely new light, and we hope that it's given you some perspective on how you can use it in ways that you may have never thought of before. So for more information and access to the session video, please visit developer.apple.com slash WWDC 17 slash 609. And please check out these related sessions. We gave just a small taste of Metal in today's section, so please check out Introducing Metal 2 if you're interested in learning more. I highly recommend watching Introducing ARKit to learn more about how it works in detail. And if our quick look at SceneKit got, got your attention, you should look at their main session this year. And there's a lot of great stuff in the debugging with Xcode 9 on top of uh, working SpriteKit, working with a new view debugger, like wireless debugging, which is really awesome. So I recommend watching that as well. Thanks, everyone, and please enjoy the rest of the conference.